Order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment. We will start with listed questions. Question one has been withdrawn. I call Mr Peter Weir. Mr Weir. Question number two. Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Speaker, corporation tax can be a major stimulus for jobs and investment in our local economy, bringing about a step change in economic performance not possible without implementing these new powers. My department commissioned the Ulster University Economic Policy Centre, which was formerly the Northern Ireland Centre for Economic Policy, to look at the benefits of moving to a corporate tax level of 12.5% from April 2017. The economy overall is expected to be 11% larger, driven by growing the private sector. Call Mr. Weir for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her reply. I'm sure we all welcome the uh, announcement on corporation tax, but given the fact that the earliest that it can be brought into effect by way of reduction is 2017, um, what does the Minister feel that Invest NI could do between then and now to take advantage of the uh, reduction? Yes, indeed. Uh, it is the case, uh, as you pointed out, Mr. Weir, that the uh, earliest that the rate can be uh, reduced is probably around April 2017. But before that time, uh, we need to have very clear messaging uh, around when precisely it is that the new regime is going to come into place and uh, what rate it's actually going to be set at. So really, we're talking about the date and the rate. And once we have both of those aspects clarified uh, by the executive, uh, then Invest Northern Ireland will be able to sell the proposition uh, right across the world. And uh, if you look at the work that was carried out uh, by the Ulster University, they're actually saying, because it takes time for uh, businesses to make decisions uh, around moving, uh, that if we go out early uh, and sell the lower corporate tax level, that we may see firms coming earlier, actually, than the tax rate uh, being reduced. So we may see benefits coming even before uh, the costs kick in in terms of our uh, block grant. So it is important to have the date uh, and the rate set, and we're looking forward to a discussion at the executive in relation to both of those issues in the very near future. Call Mr Basil McCree. Uh, Minister, on uh, the 11th of January in the BBC, uh, you made a statement that says in relation to corporation tax, so that means that the people will have an extra £3,000 in their pay packet per year. I just wonder how you arrived at that figure and if it's for all of us. Thank you, Member First question. Indeed, uh, again, referring back to the work carried out for me uh, by the then Northern Ireland Centre for Economic Policy. Um, and the work that they carried out uh, very clearly indicated uh, that productivity would rise in the economy uh, overall. And because of that, uh, they made the uh, assumption that uh, productivity would rise by 5.9% uh, based on the work that they carried out. Uh, and if you look across the economy, that means a general increase uh, of £3,000 per annum uh, into employees' wage packets. So obviously it's very generalised, I accept that, and not every single person will see that increase. Some others will see bigger increases. Uh, but I know that he will understand that the, the productivity issue has long been a drag on the economy here in Northern Ireland. And what we really want to see uh, is a closing of the gap between productivity levels in Northern Ireland and productivity levels in the rest of the UK. And I firmly believe uh, that the lowering of corporation tax will enable us to be able to do that. Call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, could the Minister give the House some indication as to what assessment she has made of the actual cost to the block grant of the reduction of corporation tax to 10 per cent, as she has advocated herself? Well, the reason I personally uh, believe in a 10% rate, and I understand that we have to come to executive agreement on this matter, and uh, it may not be the case that we settle at the 10% uh, rate, was uh, in relation to competitiveness with our uh, closest neighbour in the Republic of Ireland, which, as you know, has set the rate at 12.5% uh, for some considerable time now, and uh, have benefited greatly because of that. So the work that was carried out uh, by Ulster University Economic Policy Group uh, did take the assumption of 12.5%. Uh, so therefore the work I have received is based on that 12.5%. But if you extrapolate it down, uh, it would give us even more of a competitive advantage. 
But I think the important thing to recognise is the fact that Invest Northern Ireland have had a very strong proposition over this past couple of years based on the talent of our young people. And what we have now uh, is a proposition of tax and talent. So we have both of those elements in our armoury now. And given that we have both of those elements, I think we have a very strong proposition for going to the United States and indeed other places and for bringing more, even more, inward investment into Northern Ireland. I call Mr Alex Maskey. Can I thank the Minister for her uh, response so far and uh, somewhat of a follow-on from the previous question. Uh, would the Minister have any idea as to w how the money which would be costed, if you like, or which would be uh, against the corporation tax reduction, how the offset against the block grant may be met? Well, first of all, the work carried out by Ulster University points out that we may st start to see uh, about 5 to 10 per cent benefit to the Northern Ireland economy before we actually take the hit in, in terms of the block grant. So I welcome that because we're going to see pe more people investing in Northern Ireland even before uh, the corporate tax uh, is lowered uh, and therefore we will see more investment into Northern Ireland and we will benefit uh, as a government because of that. Uh, in terms of the hit to the block grant, uh, work is still continuing between the Department of Finance and the Treasury Ministers to actually bottom out the very precise figure as to uh, what it's going to mean for our block grant. And of course, those all are all matters that will be discussed in the next comprehensive spending review. Uh, at that stage, we will have a completely clear picture as to what it will mean uh, in terms of the block grant, and we will then look to see where we can make savings to offset uh, what will be a big hit on the block grant. But I have to say, uh, to you and to the House that I believe we're in a situation now as an economy where we can't just sit back uh, and do nothing. We have to do something different and I believe that doing something different is to use the corporate tax uh, reduction to bring more investment into Northern Ireland and I think the whole economy will grow as a result of that. People will have more money in their pay packets mm -hmm. and that will help uh, everyone, not just big business and I've heard it said by some that big business is going to benefit from this, but really for the executive, it's about job creation and creating more jobs right across Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Robin Swan for a question number three. The estimated overseas visitor figures quoted by Tourism Ireland for 2014 are very positive, and I remain confident that we will meet the targets set for tourism in the programme for government. The next set of official statistics for Northern Ireland visitor numbers for the first nine months of 2014 is due to be published on the 22nd of January 2015. Mr Swan for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, Minister, figures released by Tourism Ireland on the 30th of December showed an increase to the Republic of Ireland of overseas visitors of 8.6%. Whereas there was only an increase of overseas visitors to Northern Ireland of 5%. Can the Minister tell me what steps she's taken to try to close that balance and increase the number of overseas visitors coming to Northern Ireland? Well, uh, again, uh, it's around collaboration between uh, Tourism Northern Ireland, Tourism Ireland, Invest Northern Ireland, about getting the package for Northern Ireland completely right. Um, I welcome the fact that there has been an increase uh, in overseas visitors. Um, and I welcome the fact that we are now very strategically focused on bringing more visitors to Northern Ireland. But to make that happen, we have to have more direct access coming into uh, our airports, and that is something that I am very firmly focused upon. And I've said very many times that I would like to see a route to Germany, uh, a route to Canada, a route perhaps to the Middle East, and those are all areas that we are working on with the airports and with a number of different airlines as well. Call Mr. Alistair Ross. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister and the whole House will obviously be aware of the Gobbins Path project in East Santrum due to open later this year. How important does the Minister think that that project will be in attracting more overseas visitors to Northern Ireland? And I do welcome the progress that's been made uh, on the Gobbins Path. I think it will be an absolutely outstanding uh, visitor attraction when it is completed, uh, and one that will invoke. Uh, some of the memories uh, when you look at the old photographs of the Gobbins Path, I think it will be uh, simply outstanding and actually the last international visit I had I was talking about the Gobbins Path and a lot of people were very excited about the prospect of being able uh, to visit the path again. Um, I think it will very much add to the Causeway Coast and Glens uh, experience, an experience which already is outstanding. But to bring a, a, well, I was going to say a new facility, it is of course a very old path, but to bring it back to life again 
uh, will indeed uh, add to uh, the offering that we have to put on the international stage. And I look forward very much to it coming uh, online, hopefully uh, later on this year. Call Mr. Pat Sheehan. I'm going to ask you to ask you to uh, I'm sure the Minister will be aware that the uh, retention and the reduction of VAT rates for, the tourism, for tourism services in the south has contributed to their success down there. And I wonder, could the Minister update us on any discussions she might have had about a reduction in the VAT rate here for the tourism industry in the north? Well, of course, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, this was a matter that was raised in the House just earlier uh, in relation to VAT reductions. And, uh, of course, members will know uh, that VAT is a national matter that's dealt with at Westminster. There's a number of organisations uh, and individuals who have lobbied me in relation to the reduction on the rate of VAT. It has been a great enabler in the Republic of Ireland. There's no getting away from that. Uh, we just have to continue to make the case uh, to uh, the UK Exchequer that uh, it would help not just ourselves but other regions of the UK as well uh, and enable them to be competitive in what is a very competitive market. Well, Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister how much of the additional £2.2 .2 million she received for tourism in Budget 2015-16 she will allocate on a tourism events fund for 2015-16? Yes, a member can ask that question, but there's another question coming up later in which I will answer that question. Call Ms. Karen McEvitt. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Earlier in your answer uh, to this question, you did speak about uh, EU countries and, and um, trying to increase the, the tourism level back to here. But I would like to ask the Minister um, what conversations she's had uh, with the Irish and British governments on expanding the short stay. Uh, visas for the Chinese and Indian visitors uh, to the common travel area, uh, and that will include um, visitors from um, countries outside of the EU. And I, I'm sure she would join with me in welcoming that pilot initiative that has taken place in relation to uh, Chinese and Indian visitors. Uh, I think it's probably a little bit too early to know whether it has been a success. I would imagine it will uh, be a great success because obviously we have been very keen to attract those visitors uh, up to Northern Ireland from Dublin. And in the past, the official advice, of course, was that you needed two visas. Uh, and it was certainly a drag on the number of visitors uh, that would then visit us uh, in Northern Ireland from Dublin. So I look forward to um, seeing just how that has made a difference to the number of Chinese and Indian visitors. I would, of course, welcome the opportunity to expand that to other countries as well. Call Mr Stephen Mutry for a question. Question for Deputy Speaker. Invest Northern Ireland is only able to provide information on new business starts where it has, been, where it has provided support to the business. Since the 1st of April 2011 to the 31st of March 2014, Invest Northern Ireland has provided free advice and guidance to 422 new business start projects in the Upper Bank constituency through the Regional Start Initiative, formerly known as the Enterprise Development Programme. A further 25 new business starts have received financial support from Invest Northern Ireland. Mr. Mutri for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. Given the proactive role that Invest NI have played in Craig Avon in the recent past, is the Minister confident that this can be sustained in future years, given the enormous potential for Craig Avon, not least in its considerable land bank? And uh, I know he would want to join with me in congratulating. Um, the uh, indigenous businesses in Craig Avon and the way in which they have uh, moved forward. Indeed, two of the top indigenous investors for 2014-15 are in the Upper Ban area. That's Almac uh, and Thompson Aero seating. So those two uh, out of the top five, I think he should be very proud of that. There is a, a very entrepreneurial uh, base in Craig Avon. Uh, and we want to see even more business starts coming forward and we look forward to working uh, with the new council to see what it is uh, that we can bring value added to the new economic development powers that they have. Call Mrs Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for warm words of encouragement to businesses in Craig Avon. But could I ask the Minister, has there been any further uh, discussions in, re in relation to the extension of enterprise zones and would you consider Craig Avon uh, an area that could benefit from such? Uh, 
Well, we haven't uh, completed the journey in relation to the enterprise zone in Coleraine as yet. I'm uh, a little disappointed around that, I have to say. Uh, we've been trying uh, to facilitate the discussions that are ongoing uh, in Coleraine uh, around the enterprise zone, so we really need to focus uh, on achieving uh, that part of what was the economic pact. Uh, and uh, once that's in place, then certainly I'm sure other areas will want to look at enterprise zones as well. Uh, but there's nothing to stop uh, a local council with their new economic development powers uh, looking at how they could market their own particular area to attract inward investment in. And I do hope that the new councils will work with Invest Northern Ireland in looking for the unique selling point of each of the different areas of Northern Ireland so that we can look at that uh, sub-regional growth and move it forward in that respect. Ms Claire Sugden for a question. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, question number five. The Royal and Ancient uh, announced on Monday the 16th of June 2014 that the Royal Portrush Golf Club had been invited to join the Rota to host the Open Championship. It is hoped that the first event will be hosted as early as 2019, however this is still to be confirmed by the Royal and Ancient and the Royal Portrush Golf Club. It is subject to securing planning approvals for course improvements and completion of the works. The full planning application for the required course improvements was submitted to DOE Planning Service at the beginning of December 2014 and is currently progressing through the consultation and approval process. Once approval is secured, it is hoped that works will commence on site later this year. Well, Ms. Sugden for supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for her uh, response. Um, I've just asked the Minister, can she outline um, what consultation she's had with RNA in res um, to ensure that the golfing world as others are satisfied with what the North Coast has to offer? Well, that was very much part of our preliminary conversations before they announced that they would come uh, to Royal Portrush. And, uh, of course, the fact that we were able to host the Irish Open at Royal Portrush back in 2012 gives them a great degree of confidence that we were going to be able uh, to deliver on the promises that we were making in terms uh, of the Open. But there are uh, a number of planning issues that need to be uh, sorted out over the next period of time. I'm confident uh, that we'll, we will move those forward. As I say, the planning application just went in at the beginning of uh, December, so there is a little bit of time, but hopefully uh, the new council and the planning authorities will look upon uh, the application sympathetically because it will be a tremendous opportunity if we can bring uh, the Open to Northern Ireland in 2019. Call Mr George Robinson. Uh, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, to the Minister, <clears throat> there's been much talk in the media about hotel development on the North Coast as essential for further hotels to be de developed on the North Coast in order to uh, <clears throat> have the Open come to Portrush in 2019. Um, well, obviously, I would like to see uh, more hotel um, facilities put in place on the North Coast. There uh, are gaps, certainly, in the five-star market in that area. Uh, as this House will be fully aware, uh, the Run Kerry uh, development had uh, received planning permission, um, but the uh, estate uh, and the grounds um, that were earmarked for that application have now been sold uh, by the McNaughton estate uh, to Dr Peter Fitzgerald and um, the land that the Runcarry development uh, was to uh, be developed upon is now uh, part of Dr Fitzgerald's portfolio and therefore it is uncertain uh, as to what will happen in terms of that particular application but I hope that there will be others that will look at the opportunities in and around uh, the open coming uh, to Royal Portrush and whether they can develop uh, hotel facilities there as well. As to whether it will um, damage uh, our ability to host uh, the open, I don't think it will damage it one iota because people who attend uh, these events are well used to travelling and indeed many of them uh, when they go to other courses, have to travel for over an hour to get from their accommodation uh, to uh, the uh, event. So I don't think that the, not having a hotel there will damage that particular event. Obviously, I would like to see more development of hotels in and around the North Coast, notwithstanding that. Call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, just following on from the Minister's last uh, answer on comparative travel times, in terms of comparative economic impact, you should be aware that. Um, uh, when the Irish Open was at Port Rush, some felt 
Uh, shall we say a little disappointment uh, that spectators maybe didn't spend as much time and money as they, traders may have hoped they would in, in town. So can she compare the economic impact of the Irish Open at Port Rush with, say, the last Open at Royal Liverpool or indeed the last Irish Open uh, at Fota Island in County Cork? And uh, I think to uh, Mr Nesbitt's point about not being able to get out and um, integrate with the town and the surrounding area, that issue has now been addressed by uh, the European Tour and they are now saying that if people want to leave the course and come back again, uh, they can do that. So I think that, that is, I very much welcome that uh, issue that has been resolved. Um, I do regret that people weren't able to leave Royal Portrush and go into Portrush and then come back again. They had to stay on the course. Um, but that has been sorted out now and therefore I think it will have more of an impact when we have uh, the Irish Open uh, at uh, Royal County Down, which we are very much looking forward to hosting this year and of course down to Enniskillen in 2017. Call Mr Sean Lynch for a question. Can I have a share? Question number six. The waterways of Northern Ireland have the potential to become an integral part of the tourism experience in Northern Ireland. The proposed Ulster Canal development could provide opportunities for canal boating as well as supporting infrastructure to support walking and cycling, all of which would benefit our visitors and the local area. Although this project is being led by DECAL, NITB continues to work with the Ulster Canal Interagency Group through the Destination for Manor Steering Group and with the Clonus Ernest Blackwater project to try and maximise the tourism benefit that this project could bring. Well, Mr Lynch for supplement. And I want to thank the Minister for her answer, which was uh, somewhat encouraging. Would she agree with me because the canal does go in Monaghan and for Manor Calvin and and Tyrone, that both tourism boards on the island of Ireland work closely together to see that this is a success? Well, as I indicated to the member, this is being led uh, by DECAL and indeed uh, by uh, their counterparts in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, Heather Humphreys, the TD for Calvin Monaghan, has taken a, a very particular interest uh, in this matter, as you would imagine. Um, it, it's in part of her constituency as it is in part of our uh, constituency, and therefore she is very keen uh, to move this whole project forward. And she, uh, on the last occasion I was speaking to her, did again mention to me uh, the need to push ahead on the Ulster Canal. So I think there is generally support uh, for the project. Uh, I suppose the big challenge for us all is in relation to the funding uh, of the project, and certainly the Northern Ireland Tourist Board tourism Northern Ireland, as we should now be calling it, will work with their counterparts to try and assist and make sure that all of the tourism benefits are put into any business case that's put forward. Call Mr William Humphrey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for answering. The Minister is quite right. The primary responsibility lies with the Department of Culture, Arts and Leisure. Can I ask the Minister, in terms of the cross-border element, is there a collaborative approach being taken in terms of Fermanagh Council uh, and also in terms of funding? Obviously, in the current economic climate, budgets are of uh, a, a tight nature. How has the uh, department looked at the possibility of funding, because it's a cross-border venture, uh, funding from the European Union? Well, in relation to that last point, uh, I simply don't know was the answer because uh, DECAL leads on this issue. But I do uh, know, and I have been advised, that some 54 million euros uh, would be needed to secure um, the project uh, and to get it completed within a period of 21 to 24 months. So it's a large sum of money. Uh, I think if there are options to look uh, elsewhere for the funding, then of course we would be supportive of those being uh, explored. As regards Fermanagh Council, as I understand it, they are part of the uh, Fermanagh. Uh, are, are part of the Ernest Clonus partnership, which seems to be driving uh, this initiative, and of course the Ernest councillors would be part of that partnership. Call Mr. Basil McCree. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, just following on, Minister, in relation to finance, because as you said, that's the real nub of this issue. Would you be in favour of raising funds from users of inland waterways? Uh, for example, a boat tax in much the same way that we, use, uh, for, uh, we raise money from car taxes, provided that this money was put specifically for enhancing inland waterways? 
Well, I'm not sure that that's a matter for me as the Tourism Minister. I want to encourage more people to come um, and, and use the inland waterways. And, of course, uh, I want them to use Loch Ney and, and Loch Earn uh, in particular. Um, uh, it is a matter probably for the executive as a whole, but principally it's certainly a matter uh, for the decal minister. Call Mr Morris Devaney for a question. Question 7. Due to the difficult financial challenges facing the public sector, the executive required departments to make significant savings. Given these circumstances, the Northern Ireland Tourist Board's Open Call Tourism Events Fund for the 2015-16 financial year has not yet been launched. However, as events play a key role in driving tourism to Northern Ireland, I am delighted to announce that I have secured £1 million for the Northern Ireland Tourist Board's Tourism Events Scheme next year. Tourism NI, as it is now, is currently working up the detail of this, and I expect it to open in early February. Tourism NI provides funding for the Wall City Tattoo in 2013, totally £50,000 and a further £30,000 in sponsorship support via the Northern Ireland Tourist Board Tourism Events Sponsorship Scheme for the 2014 event. Well, Mr Devaney for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I, I thank the Minister for her response, and in particular the announcement that the Events Fund will reopen. And this will be welcome news for the people in Londonderry and across Northern Ireland. Can I ask the Minister to outline what support her department has put into Londonderry to support tourism over the last number of years? Well, it's very difficult to know where to start in relation to the support that we've put into Londonderry because we have put a lot of not just finance but support uh, into the tourism product uh, in the city, uh, in particular through the Built Heritage Programme uh, and the development of the Walled City Lighting uh, Strategy as well. We put £8.1 million uh, into the Built Heritage Programme, uh, the total project costs uh, of which were £24 million and another 1.6 million into the lighting strategy. Six projects were identified for financial support under the Built Heritage Programme. Uh, the member will be very aware of these because uh, when he was a local councillor, he lobbied very hard in relation to a number of these. Uh, the Apprentice Boys uh, Memorial Hall, First Derry Presbyterian Church, St Columns Cathedral, Aris Comkill, uh, the Playhouse Theatre and the Guild Hall. We will continue to support uh, investment in the North West and indeed across Northern Ireland in terms of our uh, tourism product because I believe we have a very strong product and we have a very good story to tell in terms of Londonderry. Call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I, I welcome this uh, U-turn by the Enterprise Minister in relation to the, the yeah, fantastic yeah, yeah. Uh, Tourism Events Fund. It will be welcome news to many organisations across Northern Ireland that are providing vital cultural and social economic development in our community. Can I ask the Minister, I think for the third time today, um, how, how she will ensure that this fund is placed on a more uh, stable footing and that we won't have to revisit uh, this budgetary reduction on an annual basis? Well, I thank the member for his question, but he should cover his blushes because it's no thanks to the Alliance Party that I have a million pounds extra in my events fund who voted against the budget. It's no wonder he has his head down, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I, I mean, it's absolutely outrageous that somebody could get up here and accuse me of doing a U-turn when it was I that went to the executive and argued for extra money into the events fund with no help from his party. Yeah. Zero help from his party. Yeah. So I'll take no lectures from the Alliance Party yeah. in relation to the events fund. Call Mr Danny Kinahan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And uh, we've just heard from the Minister a, a mass of good news projects and others going forward. But when are we going to get a, a tourism strategy that actually shows us and everyone in Northern Ireland how it all links together so everyone everywhere can really feel that they're part of it, whether it's bed and breakfasts or, or others? Well, perhaps if the member, who is a member of the Deputy Committee, had been in the chamber this morning for my announcement in relation to Tourism NI, he would have heard precisely what we're doing in relation to the tourism strategy, and perhaps he'd like to read Hansard and find out. Yeah. Order. That ends the period for listed questions, and we will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr Jim Allister. Thank you. As is my wont, I'll take the Minister back into calmer waters. Um, the Minister will be aware 
of the very heavy economic cloud that has been hanging over North Antrim with the looming closure of JTI Gallaghers. Uh, what action has the Minister taken since that announcement and has she any good news to bring to the House on that front? Well, I thank the member for raising uh, that hugely important issue. And, um, I had a meeting with uh, management from JTI Gallagher uh, last week. And, um, they are finishing off their consultation. And, uh, they said, as they would promise to come back uh, to me uh, and to the Minister for Employment and Learning uh, before they finished that consultation. Uh, we had a very useful meeting in relation to where they thought they were going uh, in terms of JTI. Uh, and uh, we stand ready to help in any way that we possibly can. He will be aware that there has been, I don't like to call it a counter proposal, there has been some very good work carried out by local management and local uh, staff in relation to a proposal that has been put forward. Uh, that was brought to me and other members of the executive. Uh, and I could see uh, great merit in that proposal, and I have indicated again that I stand ready to help in any way that I can. Uh, the meeting took place up here uh, at Parliament Buildings. I had offered to go to Ballymena to meet uh, with the folk, but it suited better in terms of flights, etc., that uh, we had the meeting here. So that meeting took place just last week. Call Mr. Alistair for supplementary. If all efforts fail, uh, and we have this closure, it underscores the great importance of attracting foreign direct investment specifically into North Antrim, given that in the last five years, despite the fact, and I gladly acknowledge it, that we've had very good help from InvestNI for businesses like Wrightbus, but in the last five years, in terms of bringing in foreign direct investment visitors to North Antrim, there have only been eight, eight visits in five years to North Antrim, in contrast to 739 in the same period to the four Belfast constituencies. How can that record be justified, and is it something that the Minister stands over? Well, as I have said many times in this House, that when there is a pool of skills, we can then market that pool of skills to international investors, and we will do exactly that. Uh, and can I say to him, whilst uh, Randox is not in the Antrim constituency, Randox is a very short hop from the North Antrim constituency. And I hope he will join with me in welcoming those 540 new jobs, uh, which we announced in Antrim last week. Uh, and I do hope uh, that if uh, best efforts fail in terms of JTI Gallagher, that there may be opportunities close at hand uh, for some of those workers and some of whom may have uh, transferable skills uh, into uh, Randox. But we will work in a strategic way with the Department of Employment and Learning uh, if it comes to the point uh, that JTI Gallagher decides to close and leave North Antrim. We will work in a strategic way with the company. They have made their decision early for reasons that have been, uh, that have been rehearsed in this House before, and that then gives us some time to work uh, in a very strategic way. Often we don't have time uh, to plan for the future, but we do have time to plan for these particular workers, and that's what we intend to do. Mr. Samuel Gardner for topical questions. Thank, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister tell us how she encourages tourists to visit Upper Ban? Well, again, um, that was a, a subject that came up for discussion earlier on, how Tourism Northern Ireland was going to work collaboratively uh, with the new councils, uh, particularly in relation to community planning, to see where the unique, unique selling points were uh, for tourism around Northern Ireland. <coughs> we will know that we have nine key destinations across Northern Ireland, and certainly it is my hope uh, that all of the 11 uh, super councils will work together collaboratively with Tourism NI, with Invest Northern Ireland and with Tourism Ireland to market their own particular areas. Mr. Gardner, for supplementary. Thank you. Thank the Minister for her reply thus far. As the Minister will know, Lurgan has Northern Ireland's largest and most beautiful urban park, and we have only, uh, and also have the out only outdoor ski slopes at Silverwood. Are these really being promoted as well as they could be, Minister? I missed that last. 
Well, I mean, the, the, the parks uh, form very much part of what we're trying to move into now in, in uh, Tourism Northern Ireland because the outdoor activities piece is becoming more and more a selling point uh, for tourism, uh, for marketing purposes. A lot of families now like to get out into the outdoors uh, and enjoy that together. And therefore, when we welcome international visitors, uh, we need to be able to market that well uh, indeed with Tourism, Ireland, uh, with tourism Northern Ireland and with uh, the local council. So it is about collaboration and partnership, about getting the message over uh, to the international market about what of the uh, nine key destination areas we have to offer. Lord Morrow for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could the Minister give us an update today on the Gas to the West project, please? I can indeed, and uh, very exciting news in relation uh, to the Gas to the West project. The preferred bidder uh, has been announced, and as I understand that the licence will be awarded uh, in early February. Uh, there will then follow a period where uh, the um, company will go out and engage uh, with the local community in relation uh, to the gas network. I think that it will be a tremendously uh, exciting time for areas of the West which, frankly, have been forgotten about in relation to infrastructure. Uh, and uh, Indeed, we have seen over this past number of days how the water infrastructure has been left in a very poor way, uh, many of our constituents being left to fend their own devices. So I'm determined that this Gas to the West project moves ahead and moves ahead in a very timely manner. Yeah. Call Lord Morrow for supplementary. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for her very positive response and I must say I welcome the news that she is able to deliver to the House here today. When this project was first promoted, one of the areas that seemed to be excluded was the Clahar Valley. Uh, could the Minister tell us today, are there any proposals to ensure that the Clahar Valley is not forgotten about in this project, as it very much is the gateway to the West? Well, I'm delighted to tell the Member today that the most recent uh, route map that I have seen includes the Clahar Valley. Yeah. And therefore, the Clahar Valley will now uh, very much be part of the transmission uh, network. And, uh, we look forward to it delivering uh, for Dungannon, for the Clocker Valley, for Enniskillen, for Cookstown and for Straban. And uh, that Gas to the West project, I think, Deputy Speaker, hasn't been talked about much, but it really will make a difference to a lot of people right across uh, the west of the province, both in terms of our industrial firms, but also in terms of domestic homes as well. And so we look forward to it being delivered. We'll call Mr Sammy Douglas for a topical question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, would the Minister um, join with me in congratulating Horn Wolf in securing the major contract for the Bifur Dolphin upgrade rig? Well, I do indeed uh, welcome that announcement, and uh, I understand that the company are also to take on 60 permanent staff due to an upturn in business, and I very much uh, welcome that increase uh, as well. Uh, what I really welcome is the fact that um, the Department of Employment Welding Academy uh, trainees are now coming out of that academy uh, and are now uh, going to be working in Harland and Wolf because we remember on the last occasion that Harland and Wolf secured a contract there was quite a hue and cry uh, about workers coming in uh, to Northern Ireland but I welcome the fact that Dell has put that welding academy in place and there are trainees actually now going into Harland and Wolf so it's something to be very much welcomed. Call Mr. Douglas for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the Minister for her answer so, so, uh, thus far. But um, could she outline, apart from the possibly a thousand jobs that this, is going to, this uh, rig is going to create, could she also outline the wider opportunities that will um, flow from this development on Queen's Island? Well, again, if there are people working uh, in Queen's Island in relation to this Harland and Wolf contract, then uh, they will uh, need to be uh, fed, they will need somewhere to stay, and therefore there are knock-on impacts in relation to the hotel industry uh, and indeed to the hospitality industry. Uh, and I am very encouraged by the fact that 
uh, this welding course has been made available because as I visit small uh, manufacturing companies right across Northern Ireland, one of the issues that came up quite frequently is the fact that young people in Northern Ireland didn't really have that skill anymore and they were having to bring in uh, experienced welders from elsewhere. So I welcome that fact uh, and I think that this is a good news story for East Belfast and indeed for Northern Ireland. Well, Mr. Cathal Boylan for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister is well aware of the recent decision by Tesco not to locate an RMA and the anticipated job loss that that creates. Could I ask the Minister what she is doing or her department is doing to create greater economic activity in RMA City and District and what assurances she can give to the people of RMA that they will benefit from her departmental spend? Well, we don't usually um, get involved in retail uh, development in terms of the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. Uh, I know that there uh, will have been a number of people disappointed by Tesco's decision not to go ahead uh, with their plant store in Armagh. However, when one door closes, perhaps another opens, and there may be other uh, retailers that would be interested in located in Armagh. And I know, for example, that there was uh, one of their competitors had looked at Armagh and then decided because Tesco was going to that they weren't going uh, to Armagh. So there may be opportunities there, uh, and probably it is something for the local uh, chambers and indeed the council to take up. As I say, we don't usually uh, get involved with retailers. What we do get involved with, however, is in relation to the supply chain to retailers. And I know for certain that they have been coming under great pressure uh, from uh, the likes of Tesco, Asda, Sainsbury's, in relation to their margin. So a lot of our agri companies are very much feeling the pressure as well uh, in the supply chain, and it's something that we're very much keeping an eye on. Mr. Boylan, for supplementary. Thank you very much. And could I thank the Minister for her reply? But Minister, could I ask, a lot of people in town around the RMA always talk about uh, transport infrastructure and the infrastructure itself. And these are barriers that are in place to stop economic investment in RMA. Can you give an assurance or do you intend to talk to other ministers to try and overcome those barriers to try and encourage economic growth and development within the RMA area? Well, I would have thought that there's another minister in this uh, place that you would be well placed to mention that to, and I understand he's a constituency member for uh, Newry and Armagh. Uh, the DRD minister is responsible for transport links, uh, and I agree with him. When you look at economic development across Northern Ireland, infrastructure is a critical part of that element. And that's true whether uh, it's roads, uh, whether it's telecoms, and I know the member has mentioned telecoms to me uh, on a number of occasions, but in this occasion he has mentioned uh, infrastructure in terms of roads, and I would support him in developing the roads infrastructure right across Northern Ireland. Well, Ms. Anna Lowe for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, the, the Hunter report recommends the development of a tourism growth fund jointly supported with the new council. Can the minister outline her implementation plan for this, please? The joint fund will be taken forward by the new chief executive and uh, the new chairman of uh, Tourism Northern Ireland in collaboration with the new super councils when they're in place after March. And uh, we look forward to their proposals coming forward, uh, as we will then, of course, want to support any bid that they may make uh, to uh, the executive in terms of procuring a joint uh, tourism fund. Call Ms. Lowe for supplementary, and I would ask I you to be brief. I thank the Minister for her response, and I think it's a great idea for Council to be working together. Um, the Ramblers Federation has always said there is a huge potential for Northern Ireland to develop walking tours, except that various councils don't work together to promote a joint up approach that we can walk right across the coastline of Northern Ireland. I wonder would the Minister uh, commit herself to maybe looking at this area? Well, certainly uh, any of the councils that want to work collaboratively to put forward uh, walking routes in the nine key destination areas will find that we will be very supportive in that respect because outdoor activity holidays, as I've indicated, have become very much uh, the vogue and uh, we want to make sure that we have the right infrastructure, and there's that word again, in place for our tourism visitors. Order. Time is up.